And next, we're going to listen to a wonderful lecture from Leah Stewart. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is my first ever craft essay, craft lecture. Uh, thank you to Gwen and Adam for convincing me to do it. And uh, thank you to all the faculty who do one, because now that I've written one myself, I understand that they're hard to write. Uh, thank you to Brianna, who made my PowerPoint. And I have a couple of clips in here that I had no idea how to record. She recorded them. She embedded them in the PowerPoint. So thank you, Brianna. And thank you to Jonathan for showing me how to use my PowerPoint. <laughs> OK. The characterizing gaze, or acting is reacting. Here is a small but significant moment from Middlemarch, one of the great novels about character. At the beginning of chapter six, we meet a clergyman's wife named Mrs. Cadwallader as she pauses to have a quick negotiation over fowls with the woman who keeps the lodge on a grand estate. We might determine from Mrs. Cadwallader's hard bargaining and many interactions she'll go on to have that she is bossy, demanding, critical, and thoroughly convinced of her right to manipulate others. We would not be wrong. The lodge keeper reacts not to contradict that impression, but to complicate any negative feelings it might cause us to have. Laughing and shaking her head slowly with an interjectional surely, surely, from which it might be inferred that she would have found the countryside somewhat duller if the rector's lady had been less free-spoken and less of a skinflint. What's more, George Elias tells us, the farmers and laborers of the area in general appreciate the anecdotes Mrs. Cadwallader's behavior provides, preferring her greatly to a much more exemplary character with an infusion of sour dignity. By contrast, Mr. Brook, the wealthy, kind, but indolent man Mrs. Cadwallader is on her way to visit, sees Mrs. Cadwallader's merits from a different point of view and winced a little when her name was announced in the library. The amused lodge keeper is a character of far less significance to the story than Mrs. Cadwallader and far, far less than Mr. Brook. She is in fact so minor, we will never see her again. So minor that complicating Mrs. Cadwallader is clearly her reason for being. Her success in doing so, despite her rank on the scale of importance, is attributable to the order in which these points of, views are, points of view are offered and to the larger space hers occupies on the page, and most of all to the fact that Eliot, with her particular brilliance for conjuring humanity, gives her a few good lines of dialogue, a couple of quick sketching details, and a name. It doesn't matter that she appears in the story for only a page, because Eliot assures us that she exists outside of her role in it. Just as we register and take into account the reactions of actual people, we register and take into account hers. In fiction, as in life, we participate in communal judgment subconsciously and all the time. Star rankings on the internet influence our opinions, and we don't even know those people. How much more readily, then, are we influenced by the opinions of people we do know? In that category, I include invented people, whom, after all, we sometimes know very, very well. About 10 years ago, I got an important lesson in the narrative uses of this, our influenceability, from a TV show about TV shows. Called The Writer's Room, it featured interviews with the writers of various popular series. If you've watched the sitcom Parks and Recreation, you might recall that in season one, its central character, Leslie Nope, comes off as a bit of a ding-dong. This, the writers said in the interview I saw, was unintentional. When they realized the impression the character was making, they changed not so much who Leslie was, but how people responded to her. This from Amy Poehler, who played the character and should know. Co-creator Mike Schur added, we had people be impressed by her work ethic instead of going like, ugh, why do I have to work on this thing that I don't want to work on? And that, I think, largely changed the perception. As a viewer, I had noted the shift in Leslie's character, but this interview made me realize that I had wrongly attributed the cause. 
Look at the difference in how Leslie's colleagues react to her in these two scenes of meetings, the first from the very first episode, the second from season two. <laughs> Leslie is, as Amy Poehler asserted, the same, but she is also different because other people see her differently and in narrative as in life, she reacts to their reactions. Their reactions shape her sense of self. When I was writing my last book, which follows a young, handsome, successful television actor who gets kidnapped, I kept thinking that it was in part about white male privilege without knowing exactly what I meant by that. Now, I understand myself. What I tried to demonstrate in that book, and in fact saw starkly illustrated in memoirs by kidnap victims, is that diminishment through others' treatment of you is entirely natural and unavoidable, and thus not some proof of weakness in the character of non-white males. It is possible to believe that you are not shaped by others' perceptions of you only when their visible reactions accord with your sense of self, which is one way of thinking about privilege. Other people's faces are a mirror in which we can't help but see ourselves. We are, at least in part, the person they perceive us to be. This is true of our invented people as well, and a characterization that does not include this is an incomplete one. There we go. In Velvet Was the Night, Sylvia Moreno Garcia introduces her character of Elvis as a thug who wanted to hold his punches. Elvis is rueful about the ironic contrast between his nature, loving music and factoids that help him construct a more organized world, and his profession, disrupting with occasional violence, radical student activities in 1970s Mexico. Nevertheless, at the moment when, where the novel begins, just before a student protest, he is eager to beat a few motherfuckers up. Why? Because one of the other hired thugs has been impugning Elvis's masculinity in veiled and irritating ways. In short, Elvis was in dire need of asserting himself, of showing his teammates that he wasn't no fucking marshmallow. He wanted to get dirty to put all those fighting techniques El Mago made them learn to good use, to show he was as capable as any of the other guys, especially as capable as El Guero, who looked like a fucking extra in a Nazi movie, and Elvis had no doubts that his dear papa had been saying Heil real merrily until he boarded a boat and moved his stupid family to Mexico. Yeah, El Guerrero looked like a Nazi and not any Nazi, but a gigantic, beefy, motherfucking Nazi. And that's probably why he was so pissed off, because when you look like a blonde Frankenstein, it's not that easy to blend in with no one. And it's much better to be a shorter, slimmer, little dark-haired fucker like Elvis. That's why El Mago kept El Guerrero for kidney smashing, and he left the lock picking, the infiltrating, the tailing to Elvis or El Gaspacho. Neither Elvis's psychological acuity nor his low opinion of El Guerrero stop him from planning to act in direct response to the other man's opinion of him. Many of the fascinating complications and conflicts in our characters, our actual characters, as well as the ones we create, arise at the intersection of our traits and inclinations and the opinions and needs and demands of others and the resulting treatment of ourselves. When the action of a plot is going to be interior as much or more than it is exterior, the more conflict we find at that junction, the better. The more at odds a character is with themselves, the more at war over competing internal and external interests, the bigger the narrative arc. Few in the whole history of heroines have made a more profoundly blinkered choice than Middlemarch's Dorothea Brooke, who chooses to marry a cold, pedantic scholar twice her age because she believes he will introduce her to a transcendent world of intellectual achievement not otherwise accessible to her as a woman in 1840s England. At least Portrait of a Lady's Isabel Archer had the hots for her terrible husband. Dorothea lacks the excuse of the animal passions, making her self-defeating marital choice entirely with her reasoning mind. Thus, George Eliot reminds us that our notions guide our lives as much, if not more, than pragmatism and physical need. And because at the same time, Eliot takes pains that we admire her heroine by admiring her so overtly herself, Dorothea's dumbass decision sets up not just the events of the plot, but Dorothea herself as a territory for expansive, complicated, and highly dramatic narrative. 
It's also worth noting that when Dorothea marries Will Ladislaw at the end of the book, this time in a happy state of fully realized and mutual love, it's a wiser version of that same faith in her own convictions that allows her to defy convention and find joy. Like Leslie Nope, she has not changed as much as understood herself. Understood herself, crucially, thanks in part to Will Ladislaw. Unlike Mr. Kasabin, her first husband, Will loves and understands her and reflects back the self she recognizes. If we are in part the person others believe us to be, if we struggle with internal and external conflicts as a result of that, what could be more satisfying, more peaceful, more unifying of the self than that? Acting is reacting. In the acting world, this truism is as widespread as the fiction world's show don't tell, and I find it infinitely more useful. To put it into practice in fiction, as in film, TV, and theater, you need more than one character on the stage. Protagonists need someone to react to, and equally vital is the need for someone to react to them. What we call literary fiction, though, perhaps especially in the short form, is full of aloneness. This is not a complaint, or at least not entirely. My own characters spend a fair amount of time alone thinking about stuff. Interiority is one of my favorite things. But I must admit that when I consider fictional moments that live in my mind like my own memories, I am hard pressed to come up with any in which a character is alone. I can easily summon the shimmering empathy felt by the narrator of Sonny's Blues as he watches his brother at the piano. Or Dorothea again, comforting Rosamund in a choked voice, even though she believes the other woman has won the heart of the man she herself loves. Dean, in Randall Keenan's Run, Mourner, Run, in the moment after his lover realizes his betrayal, reaching out and seeing his pale hand against the broad bronze back, sensing the enormity of what he had done, that his nan hand could never again touch that back, never glide over its ridges and bends and curves, never linger over that mole, pause at that patch of hair, that scar. Pride and Prejudice's Elizabeth Bennet is alone when she reads the letter from Darcy that shifts her perspective on everything she thought she knew about him and in so doing throws into doubt the previously assumed rightness of her own point of view. Until that moment, until this moment, I never knew myself. But I can't count this. Even if Darcy isn't physically present, his letter provides his half of the conversation. Without it, neither Elizabeth's comprehension nor ours would have evolved. Even if George Eliot were less good than she is at writing scenes that reveal new aspects of her characters, she would nevertheless help us know them intimately and in all their complexity. Her narrative stance, omniscient, with direct address and occasional appearances of the ruminating eye, provides a consistently characterizing gaze. Here she is employing it in one of the most famous moments in the book. One morning, some weeks after her arrival at Loic, Dorothea, and then there's an M dash, but why always Dorothea? Was her point of view the only possible one with regard to this marriage? I protest against all our interest, all, all our effort at understanding, being given to the young skins that look blooming in spite of trouble, for these two will get faded and will know the older and more eating griefs which we are helping to neglect. In spite of the blinking eyes and white moles objectionable to Celia and the want of muscular curve which was morally painful to Sir James, Mr. Kasabin had an intense consciousness within him and was spiritually a hungered like the rest of us. If not as stylistically delightful as Eliot's interruption of herself, I find equally compelling her refusal to let us loathe the loathsome character of the hypocritical banker and religious zealot Bulstrode. Here, frightened by the appearance in town of a former acquaintance who can expose the scandalous origins of his wealth, he's engaged in self-justification and seeking an atoning act. The spiritual kind of rescue was a genuine need with him. There may be coarse hypocrites who consciously affect beliefs and emotions for the sake of gulling the world, but Bulstrode was not one of them. He was simply a man whose desires had been stronger than his theoretic beliefs and who had gradually explained the gratification of his desires into satisfactory agreement with those beliefs. Are we any different? 
Elliot goes on to ask. She refuses to let even her worst characters remain for us someone we cannot understand, someone who could never be ourselves. Her type of active narrator, what I think of as a storyteller, whose voice and knowledge and judgments are not hidden from the reader, illuminates any character to whom it pays attention. As with the presence of another character in the room, the presence of the storyteller means characters are never alone. There is always someone reacting to them. Perspective shifting reactions can of course be achieved in any point of view, as in this first person example from Ursula Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. Jin Lee Ai, a man from a much evolved space traveling version of us, is envoy to a foreign planet where people are ungendered and have complicated systems of social behavior that he doesn't fully understand. Someone comes to him hoping he'll deliver money to the novel's other primary character, Estraven, a native of this planet who has tried to help Jin Lee in his diplomatic mission and been banished because of it, but whom, at this point of the story, in the story, Jin Lee doesn't trust and feels no responsibility for. When his visitor asks if Jin Lee considers himself in Estraven's debt, Jin Lee responds rather loftily that his mission overrides all personal debts and loyalties. If so, said the stranger with fierce certainty, it is an immoral mission. Jin Lee tells us, that stopped me. And then he agrees to the stranger's request. To achieve full characterization, which I'm defining as bringing the reader to know someone both alone and as part of the social web, it is perhaps all the mo more important for writers of literary fiction to find moments like this one between Jen Lee and a stranger who forces him to realize that his own place in the social web is more complicated than he wants to think. I say this because many such writers feel they don't have rec recourse to the omniscient stance, having been trained in the modern tradition opposed to the arrogance of a godlike perspective. The third person narrator who has historically dominated the creative writing workshop is a limited one, generally stripped as much as possible of knowledge or judgment separate from the character over whose shoulder they peer. When I taught a graduate class in narration and consciousness, I made some of my PhD students extremely uneasy by requiring them to write an exercise in the omniscient voice. They thought not only that they couldn't do it, but that they shouldn't. Others oft read repeated beliefs having become a self-conception. In the end, some couldn't quite get there, some did and were elated at this new understanding of themselves. I find it helpful to recall that those of us who have enjoyed and or endured academic creative writing training have internalized rules that baffle writers and readers of other types. Once I was having a conversation with a writer of literary fiction about how it seemed like the omniscient voice was coming back. Standing with us was a writer of science fiction and fantasy. He frowned, asked, where did it go? Those genres which make worlds must allow their practitioners to be gods. An interesting variation on the omniscient, which I've seen in a few recent sci-fi and fantasy novels, is its location in a narrator who is also an actor in the story. In the case of both The Raven Tower by Anne Leckie and The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin, the identity of this narrator slash actor isn't revealed for quite some time, and their omniscience is focused on the protagonist, in a way that feels like a choice rather than a limitation. Each narrator at addresses their respective protagonist as you. Because each seems to have the capability to see into multiple minds, that choice gives the narrators, and therefore our, interest in the character special weight. I see everyone, but it's you I care about. In this moment early in the fifth season, the protagonist has recently found her young son beaten to death, her husband and daughter gone. She has a power, she can connect to earth and cause earthquakes, that her society fears, a power she's passed on to her children, and she knows that her husband learned the truth about her son and killed him and that her secret is out. Here she is attempting to leave the village where she's been living under assume, an assumed identity. Your throat is tight. Tirimo has been your home for 10 years. You only started to think of it as such home around the time of Usha's birth, but that's more than you ever expected to do. 
You remember chasing Uch across the green after he first learned to run. You remember Jija helping Nassen build a kite and fly it badly. The kite's remnants are still in a tree somewhere on the eastern side of town. But it is not as hard to leave as you thought it would be. Not now, with your former neighbor's stairs sliding over your skin like rancid oil. This woman, whose name is Essen, is almost to the gate when someone tries to shoot her. She reacts without thought and activates her power. And because you don't think, because you've been trying not to think, and this means you're out of the habit, because thinking means you will remember that your family is dead and everything that meant happiness is now a lie, and thinking of that will make you break and start screaming and screaming and screaming, Essen does a terrible thing. She not only kills the people and animals in her immediate vicinity, including the town leader who was trying to help her leave, she cracks the aquifer, meaning that ultimately she's killed the town. Essen is our heroine, and this is one of the first things we see her do. But we see her do it from the point of view of someone who understands her, someone who in fact loves her, and that mitigates the effect. If a gaze can diminish, it can also improve our worth in our own eyes and those of others, including a reader's. Once we love, we see the loved one differently. In fiction, as in life, our gaze alters what it sees. What a writer does to make you love a character goes well beyond the basics of characterization, which is what we teach in classrooms with questionnaires about diaries and favorite foods and trash cans. Those questionnaires suggest that characterization is a relationship between writer and reader. I tell you what someone is like, and if I do my job right, you believe me. This can, in fact, go a long way in the case of the storyteller narrator. Take, for instance, Andrew Sean Greer's novel, Less, another book with a narrator who is an actor in the story and whose identity is for a long time concealed. I love its title character, Arthur Less, in part because, perhaps, mostly because the narrator loves him. And even when he describes Arthur's many failings and foibles, he does so with the understanding and forgiveness of love. If I love Arthur, it is at least in part because I love that love. Persuaded of its validity, I embrace it as my own. If we are writing in first person or a limited third, we need moments of intimacy, positive and negative, between characters to achieve this illuminating effect. Rather than what's in a character's trash can, we do better to ask how they react when criticized by a parent or given a compliment by a colleague, when asking for or granting a favor, when a close friend points out an uncomfortable truth. Revealing moments of intimacy can occur between any two or more people, strangers, colleagues, an old friend again encountered, and are particularly satisfying when they involve the breaking down of walls, the vulnerable expression of the self, and a sense of connection to another. In life, we are often surprised by such moments and the affection that they either reveal or give rise to. Like Elizabeth Bennett, we might think that we didn't properly know ourselves and that we didn't properly see the other person before. In the same way does one character loving another teach us to see them both differently. A story that moves toward greater understanding and intimacy might of course more succinctly be called a romance. If I'm using the word romance to mean a plot rather than a genre, I define it broadly to include not just relationships of desire and courtship, but also those between friends and family. All stories driven by romance will have one of its basic shapes, which I illustrate for students with less than and greater than signs and which involve variations on being together and apart. As Aristotle said, a story moves from bad fortune to good or good fortune to bad. A romance driving toward a happy ending is most likely to begin with its characters as far apart as possible, whether by internal or external means or both, while one headed for tragedy, like Romeo and Juliet, is most likely to begin with love at first sight. No matter which approach it takes, a romance of any kind is the story where plot is overtly the investigation of character writ large. I mean this in contrast to the more specific questions of character on which the mystery and the quest are focused and predicated. Why do we do bad things? And are we brave enough? 
the movement of the plot of a happy romance is toward a broader understanding of the self, as well as intimate access to another, an invitation to understanding in both directions. The tragic romance is one where either interfering external circumstances prevail, despite the achievement of this goal, or one that mourns the failure to achieve it. Another way to say this is that the goal of a romance plot is the acquisition of emotional intelligence, rather than the discovery of a murderer, or the securing or destroying of a magic object, or the saving or destroying of the world. Internal, rather than external achievement. The marriage, for all we call it the marriage plot, is not the point. The declaration of love is the point. The marriage is the celebratory last song. In her essay, Nothing But Herself, Embracing Jane Austen's Second Chances, Margot Livesey says that the romance speaks to the, 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 the delicate and tremulous part of ourselves that yearns for the great good fortune of intimate connection and understanding and that deep need we all have to be recognized. I imagine one reason romance continues to be viewed in certain circles, as Livesey fears it is, as slight or unworthy subject matter, is that not everyone sees the arrival at intimate connection, the development of emotional intelligence, and the expression of feeling as being a sufficient goal. I want to close with a return to The Left Hand of Darkness, which in addition to being a sci-fi novel with an interest in politics, religion, and culture, particularly how sexual practices and ideas of gender shape culture, is also, I would in fact say primarily, a romance. One of the functions of sci-fi is to demonstrate just how vastly different it's possible for our experiences and resulting worldviews to be. The farther apart people are in those worldviews, and you can't get much farther than being from another planet, the starker the misunderstandings between them, the greater the danger for resulting awfulness, and the more satisfying the crossing of that great and perilous divide to find connection. If your science fiction novel is also a romance, all of that can augment significantly the drama and intensity of your love story. Intimacy between aliens is not easily won. In Left Hand of Darkness, it requires an escape from a labor camp and a life or death trek across a frozen expanse. One night, in their tent on the ice, Jinli at last recognizes the sexual attraction between himself and Estravan. They don't act on it, but the great and sudden assurance of friendship between us rose. A friendship so much needed by us both in our exile and already so well proved in the days and nights of our bitter journey that might as well be called now as later, love. This scene, and a passage I'm about to quote, gave rise to an expression in one of my graduate classes, the tent moment, which my former student, Molly Reed, defined in an essay as characters confined, either by choice or circumstance, to share a small space where they are able to, to achieve an intimacy impossible in the wild. Tent moments, she went on to say, give the reader an emotional connection to the main character, play a pivotal role in plot, and finally become, for the main character, a frozen moment in time, something he returns to. Here is Jin Lee in a rare flash forward. Sometimes, as I am falling asleep in a dark, quiet room, I have for a moment a great and treasurable illusion of the past. The wall of a tent leans up over my face, not visible but audible, a slanting plane of faint sound, the, s I don't know how to pronounce this, the Ciceris? Ciceris? Does anyone know how to pronounce that word? <laughs> of blown snow. Nothing can be seen. The light emission of the Chabé stove is cut off, and it exists only as a sphere of heat, a heart of warmth. The faint dampness and confining cling of my sleeping bag, the sound of the snow, barely audible, Estrovan's breathing as he sleeps, darkness, nothing else. We are inside, the two of us, in shelter, at rest, at the center of all things. Outside, as always, lies the great darkness, the cold, death solitude. In such fortunate moments as I fall asleep, I know beyond doubt what the real center of my own life is, in that time that is past and lost and yet is permanent, the enduring moment, the heart of warmth. 
Likely we have, as readers, recognized from chapter one that an important relationship will develop between these two characters, but the Jinli at the beginning of the book could never have imagined it. How did Le Guin get him and us there? It starts with noticing. One character makes an imprint on another's consciousness. As readers, we notice this noticing, often because the reason for it isn't clear and therefore a mystery, and consciously or subconsciously, we bookmark a mystery. I'm not just guessing here. Neuroscience has backed up the claim E.M. Forster makes in aspects of the novel that a mystery is a pocket in time, leaving a part of the mind behind, brooding, while the other part goes marching on. There are a number of ways to achieve this bookmarking. Perhaps our point of view character notices a stranger at the next table, can't stop looking at them even while their own companions talk. Perhaps they're anticipating or dreading a meeting with someone, speculating what this person will be like. Le Guin stresses Estrovan's importance in other ways. Estrovan is the first person Jin Lee describes. The description is lengthy and detailed. And the primacy and consistency of Jin Lee's attention to Estrovan is itself a mystery. A stocky dark car hider with sleek and heavy hair, wearing a heavy over tunic of green leather worked with gold, and a heavy white shirt and heavy breeches, and a neck chain of heavy silver links, a hand broad. So he often speaks, frank yet cautious, ironic, as if always aware that I see and judge as an alien, a singular awareness in one of, a, one of so isolate a race and so high a rank. When someone intrigues or unsettles us, as Estrovan does Jinli, we become detectives, watching them for clues. From the initial noticing, our character's heightened awareness of the other person will persist, and they will draw conclusions, often the wrong ones, ones that will be barriers to intimacy. He is one of the most powerful men in the country. One feels the man's power as an augmentation of his character. He cannot make an empty gesture or say a word that is not listened to. He knows it, and the knowledge gives him more reality than most people own, a solidness of being, a substantiality, a human grandeur. Nothing succeeds like success. I don't trust Estrovan, whose motives are forever obscure. I don't like him yet I feel and respond to his authority as surely as I do to the warmth of the sun. Jinli misunderstands Estrovan constantly. He misinterprets sincerity as irony, Estrovan's efforts to help him in his diplomatic mission as attempts to gain political prestige. When we are very close to the character, we make perhaps not all, but many of the same mistakes. Jinli's Estrovan is also ours. When Jin Lee suspects that he is manipulative and untrustworthy, we must suspect that also, and so pay him the same close and wary attention. As prolonged eye contact is said to be crucial to the development of love for another person, so is this consistent gaze crucial to the development of fictional love. In other words, to our conviction that that love exists and to the love we ourselves feel for the characters involved. Noticing isn't enough, though, especially if our characters are wary of one another. Necessity is also required, a reason, perhaps a series of accumulating reasons, for the two characters to be in proximity and at least to some degree alone together. The isolation could be as complete as Jinli and Estrovan in the tent, or as partial and temporary as the words exchanged while dancing at a Jane Austen ball. Whatever the external circumstances, they must destabilize the character's relationship and so shift them out of whatever defensive postures they might have assumed. To these steps of noticing and necessity, I would add reevaluation. In the spirit of Elizabeth Bennett, reevaluation of the other person, if it is to be fully satisfying, must involve a resulting reevaluation of the self. If I had time, I would outline the numerous small reevaluations that occur on the way to the profound change in Jin Lee's consciousness. Instead, I'll quote two more passages that illustrate the connection between the reevaluation of the other and the reevaluation of the self, i.e., the kind of shifting, complicated characterization, one based on context and relationships that I'm advocating for. Here is Jin Lee in the tent, a few days into the journey across the ice. 
I looked at Estraven, stretched out sound asleep on his sleeping bag a couple of feet from me. He wore nothing but his breeches. He was hot. The dark secret face was laid bare to the light, to my gaze. Estraven asleep looked a little stupid, like everyone asleep. A round, strong face relaxed and remote, small drops of sweat on the upper lip and over the heavy eyebrows. I remembered how he had stood sweating on the parade stand in panoply or rank and sunlight. I saw, I saw him now defenseless and half naked in a colder light and for the first time saw him as he was. And again, farther along on the ice and after the blossoming of what might as well be called now as later love, he had been quite right to say that he, the only person on the planet who trusted me, was the only one I distrusted. For he was the only one who had entirely accepted me as a human being, who had liked me personally and given me entire personal loyalty, and who therefore had demanded of me an equal degree of recognition of acceptance. I had not been willing to give it. I had been afraid to give it. Now Jinli, who first saw Estraven and told us to see him as ironic, untrustworthy, manipulative, will note with assurance that he is in fact an honest person, but rarely a direct one. He knows him now. He knows far better what to tell us to see. Love in a narrative offers us one person looking at another so that our impressions are our own and theirs as well. If the writer offers us, offers us multiple points of view, as Le Guin and Eliot both do, they can flip the gaze so that after misunderstanding character X while in the perspective of character Y, we now get the riddle solved. Y, poor Y, goes on being wrong about the moment they're actually living, while we are little gods of comprehension. We not only know exactly why the moment is unfolding as it is, we recognize in a way we can't always, from the confines of our own perspective, how often we ourselves are wrong, how often we are misunderstanding and being misunderstood, how often the connections we long for slip out of our grasp. It is terribly sad to recognize that, and it is terribly beautiful to have that sadness in this moment of our perfect knowledge of the minds of others, both acknowledged and erased. Thank you.